Lieberman. She is the Irving Harris Endowed Chair of Infant Mental Health, Professor and Vice Chair of Academic Affairs at the UCSF Department of Psychiatry. She is the developer of Child Parent Psychotherapy, an evidence-based treatment for traumatized young children that is disseminated nationally and worldwide and the author of several books and numerous articles on the treatment of early childhood trauma and mental health problems. Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much, John. It is a pleasure and an honor to be doing this webinar for the American Psychological Association. And the reason I gave the title of Speaking the Unspeakable to this uh, conversation about the identification and treatment of childhood trauma is because it is very difficult to speak about trauma, both by asking what has happened to children and their families in terms of exposure to traumatic events, and once we know, making it part and parcel of the treatment process. And so speaking the unspeakable is really the goal for treatment once we know that a child has been traumatized by exposure to a frightening event. Trauma is as toxic to mental health as smoking is to physical health. And it is the most preventable cause of childhood psychopathology. And yet it continues to be unidentified and unaddressed. So as we talk about the importance of identifying trauma, and I would like to give over control of the slides to Veronica because it is not uh, progressing. The, the slides are not progressing. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, Veronica, did you want me to do that or would you like to do that? Sure. Let me, let me make you the presenter, okay? There we go. Okay. Okay. And let me pull up slides. Okay, let me, you might have to do that in just one moment, Veronica. Let me make sure that I... Okay. We're just waiting for you to um, just waiting for you to turn on your just show your screen. Okay. And there you go. There we go. Can you see it? Okay. Thank you. So if you could All go right. to the next the next slide. We are framing this uh, presentation in a developmental model that is ecological in the sense that it takes into account what are the features inside the child in terms of temperament, constitutional characteristics, propensities, and what are the characteristics in the environment in terms of the interplay between risk and protective factors? Because these are very important components of how the child is going to be affected by a traumatic event and how the child is going to be able to be our partner in the treatment. We know that adversities are risk factors to development and adversities tend to coexist and compound each other. There is research showing that once a child is exposed to one traumatic event or one major adversity, the likelihood of a second adversity increases by about 80%. Adversities create new adversities and traumatic events can create other traumatic events. I'm thinking, for example, of a child who witnessed a very severe episode of domestic violence between the parents and then has to cope not only with the experience of fear and distress from the actual event, but also the consequences of that event. 
which might involve, for example, the perpetrator being in prison, the victimized parent being uh, injured, the consequences of those uh, experiences for the everyday predictability of daily routines. So one event can multiply, can have ripple effects into many new adversities and all of those need to be taken into account in the process of identifying and addressing the impact of trauma. We also know that the more traumatic events, the more adversities, the more likelihood of psychiatric disorder. And so it's very important to have the entire context of the child, the internal characteristics of the child and the environmental characteristics of the context into account as we identify and treat trauma. Can we go to the next slide? And along these lines, we need to remember that poverty is, represents a magnet for risk factors and that being an ethnic minority is associated disproportionately with the likelihood of being poor and the likelihood of being affected by traumatic events because children of color have more access to multiple hardships and less access to services. Next slide, please. In this sense, it's important to, and now click it again, uh, to think of risk as a continuum from stress to trauma. We know that normative stress actually helps development. It helps to develop coping mechanisms. I'm thinking here, for example, about a young child whose parents are um, leaving him with a babysitter or who uh, a young child who is having a new sibling which is a completely normative event, but for a toddler or a preschooler can represent a very distressing um, uh, upheaval in terms of how everyday life unfolds and the need to share love and attention with a new sibling. Those are important developmentally appropriate stresses. But if you click again, you will find that there is also emotionally costly stress, which is stress that erodes the resilience of children by, and of adults by creating a sense of constant uh, pressure to cope with things that are difficult to cope with. Um, Chronic poverty, chronic marital distress, chronic parental depression. And finally, one more click please, traumatic stress, which is a different quantitative and qualitative level of stress. Because, and the next step, uh, slide will show us Please, a traumatic event is defined by external threat to life or physical integrity. So it happens unpredictably and suddenly, it generates horror and it floods us with a sense of helplessness. So that in the moment of the traumatic event, we are unable to cope. And in the sequelae to the trauma, we are unsure of what is safe and what is dangerous. Trauma distorts the uh, ability to differentiate between danger and safety because we were going along with an expectation of safety and suddenly something happened that shattered that expectation of safety. We know also that once a traumatic event happens, even normative stresses become costly, become uh, what Jack Shonkoff calls toxic 
because we never know when a normative stress can become an omen that something very frightening and dangerous is going to happen. Now, the key features of what determine the severity of a traumatic experience are who is the perpetrator of the traumatic event? How did it happen? Who made it happen? And the closer the relationship between the child and the perpetrator of the traumatic event, the more severe the impact of the trauma so that parents as perpetrators are uh, much more likely to increase the severity of the traumatic event. The child's age, we know that the younger the child, the more severe the impact of the trauma and the more long-lasting its effects might be. And there is a paradox here because there is a widespread but mistaken belief that small children are too young to notice or understand the impact of a traumatic event and they are resilient enough that they are able to overcome it. There is research from uh, Joy Osofsky and her colleagues following uh, the Hurricane Katrina um, showing that years later the symptoms of post-traumatic stress have actually increased in children who have not given access to resources to helping them cope with the impact of Hurricane Katrina and the sequelae that followed from that impact. And the third um, factor that is very important in predicting the severity of a traumatic event is the proximity of the child to the traumatic experience. When it happens to the child, him or herself, or to somebody that is beloved by the child, the impact is much greater. We also need to understand as we think of the impact of trauma about what the traumatic moment involves. And this is the actual moment when the trauma hits. And here we need to think of the child being overwhelmed by sensory stimulation that is of high intensity and that affects every sensory process. Visual in the sense of frightening images, auditory in the sense of loud and frightening sounds, the smell of smoke or blood, the um, tactile experience of being hit, the kinetic experience of being shaken by a car accident, for, for example, or a train uh, wreck, or being um, shaken uh, by a perpetrator of uh, violence. And this traumatic event becomes part and parcel of the biology and the psychology of how the child then responds to the environment these traumatic moments tend to come back again and again, unbidden in the form of traumatic reminders. If we can go to the next um, slide, please. We have learned from the National Traumatic uh, Stress Network and from many, many um, statistics at the federal and state level that the first five years of life are the most dangerous in the sense that most maltreatment and accidents and intrusive medical procedures happen to children in the first five years of life. 
and maltreatment has a greater negative effect at younger ages when the coping capacities are still immature. The most pervasive form of trauma is severe neglect that is associated with lack of protectiveness to exposure to frightening and dangerous events. And that is followed by physical abuse, which uh, represents about 15 to 20 percent of traumatic uh, events in young children. And if we can go to the next slide. The uh, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, with a sample size of more than almost 11,000 children, shows that the most traumatic events tend to be interpersonal. So the traumatic loss of a parent or caregiver, domestic violence, a caregiver that is so impaired by mental illness or, or uh, um, substance exposure that they uh, constantly um, expose the child to frightening uh, experiences emotional abuse, sexual abuse, those are the most common forms of traumatic experience across the age range. And the next slide, please. Very often, children are referred to us for behaviors that are considered pathological. Aggression, withdrawal, depression, anxiety, and we tend to address the behavior as if the behavior is a characteristic of the child. It is now best practice to ask what happened to the child as a way of understanding what is the context for the child's psychological symptoms. And as we ask what happened to the child, it is very useful to use structured measures such as the UCLA Reaction Index or the TESI, Traumatic Events Stress Inventory, in order to assess systematically for exposure to the whole range of traumatic experiences that are very common in childhood and adolescence. The reason that structured instruments are very useful as part of the initial assessment is because asking routinely for exposure to trauma normalizes the high prevalence of exposure. If we can say to a parent or to a child, this, the, I'm going to ask you whether some things happen to you that happen to a lot of children. And the reason I want to ask you is because when children go through things like this, it's very frightening for them. And it affects how they feel and how they think and how they behave. And it will help us figure out how to best help you. The same message when uh, conveyed to parents of young children who cannot be self-reporters can also help the parents understand how everyday life, how unusual, frightening, unpredictable events might be affecting how the children are behaving. And in this sense, a trauma-focused or trauma-informed treatment is not treatment as usual because it is uh, organized around our understanding that once a child has been exposed to a traumatic event, that traumatic event needs to be taken into account as we try to understand how the child is responding. 
Alicia, um, we have a question from one of our audience members. If you can repeat the assessments that you recommended for assessment, please. One uh, instrument is called the UCLA Reaction Index, and it is um, developed at UCLA by Dr. Robert Pinos and his colleagues. The other one is called the TESI Traumatic Event Stress Inventory, and it is developed by uh, Chandra Ghosh Ipen and uh, Julian Ford and colleagues uh, under the aegis of the National Child Traumatic, uh, the National NCTSN, National Child Traumatic Stress uh, Network. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we can go to the next slide. Okay. The best practices for assessment are considered about three to five assessment sessions that might last between 45 minutes and an hour or an hour and a half, where trauma screening is a routine component and where we ask about the child's developmental history before and after the trauma. It includes observation of the child. It includes observation of the child-parent relationship, how the parent understands the child's experience, and the parent's reliability and empathy as an informer of the child's traumatic experience and other experiences. We look at the overlaps and divergence between how the parent understands what happened to the child and how the child narrates what happened. And of course, collateral information from other sources which might involve medical uh, reports, uh, child welfare reports, uh, school reports that help us understand the child from a multi-perspective uh, context. Now, many therapists tell us that they are not able to bill for assessments. And because an assessment period is a fundamental component for case formulation and for treatment planning. We have started talking about the treatment we develop, child parent psychotherapy, as starting with a foundational phase. So that what used to be called an assessment is now an assessment that is part of the treatment. It is uh, conducted routinely by the same therapist and it is considered as the necessary first step in getting to know each other, in trying to think together about what are the reasons for the child's emotional distress and behavioral difficulties and then that becomes the um, stem from which the treatment is planned and implemented. Next, please. Why is it important to ask about trauma? Why is it important to speak the unspeakable? John Bowlby talked about children being distressed by the experience of knowing what they're not supposed to know and feeling what they're not supposed to feel. Adults often find it difficult to know that children know family secrets or that children are exposed to family situations that are shameful or uh, difficult to, to acknowledge. The pressure on the child not to know and not to feel 
is one of the most powerful etiological factors in dissociation, depersonalization, and other defense mechanisms that keep the knowledge of the traumatic event outside of con consciousness but continues to have a very negative effect on the child's capacity to regulate affect, to trust uh, interpersonal relationships, and to explore and learn. When we give permission to the child and to the parents to talk about what happened, and when we listen supportively and with a message that this is part of the human experience in many children, in many families. There is great relief at being understood, and there is great relief in understanding that under the behaviors that give so much distress, there is pain that can be alleviated through support and through empathy. That experience, if it happens in the first session, in the first two or three sessions, can give a trajectory of hope to the treatment. Hope that what happened does not need to define the entire experience of the child and the family. And that there is there are new ways of relating that can help to overcome the sequelae of the traumatic event. And hope is the most important ingredient of all treatment, and particularly of trauma treatment. Can we go to the next one, please? As we assess in the foundational phase, we need to ask ourselves, how is the child responding to the trauma? And this, the response of the child is affected by a variety of factors. Developmental stage, different children respond to trauma according to their developmental stage. A toddler might respond with tantrums. An adolescent might respond by rebellion or and what is, I think, very important is to remember that the behavior might look different in different developmental stages, but the motivation underlying the behavior in terms of an effort at self-protection might be the same. And we will go uh, into this a little later. Uh, the temperamental characteristics of the child influence how the child responds to trauma. Children that have a very high activity level might engage in reckless um, exploration in um, behavior that looks like uh, ADHD, whereas children who are very sensitive and easily frightened might respond by withdrawing and becoming um, very um, um, inhibited in response to novelty. The extent to which the child was close to the traumatic event or heard about it from others might affect the severity of the symptoms. Whether an event was a natural disaster that happens once, once or an interpersonal event that was perpetrated by a person that the child loves and trusts is very important as well, as, so, as is the relationship to the perpetrator. And we cannot do an assessment and treatment of traumatic stress in children without looking at the impact of the trauma on the child's attachment relationships across the child's age because one of the first casualties of trauma exposure is the child's sense that the parent is going to be a reliable and effective competent protector. Even when the parent has not been the perpetrator, 
children are often disappointed that the child that the parent has not been able to prevent the traumatic event from taking place and so looking at the attachment relationship and how it was affected by the traumatic event can be a very effective tool in treatment formulation treatment planning and treatment implementation whether the trauma is acute or chronic is extraordinarily important because when there is chronic exposure to trauma, the question of how to create safety in the child's daily experience becomes a primary focus of treatment. Whereas if the event occurred once and is unlikely to occur again, we're really dealing with a post-traumatic response rather than a, a response that is being perpetuated again and again by the fact that the traumatic experience is recurring. And whether, again, whether it happened once or whether it is cumulative is also uh, a related characteristic. Always we need to rely on the presence of protective relationships in the child's life because we as therapists have a time limited presence in the child's life. The people who are going to remain as protectors and providers of safety and predictability are the caregivers. And so we need to make the caregivers our allies in the treatment uh, formulation, treatment planning, and treatment implementation. And we go to the next. Regardless of the age, there are four main characteristics of traumatic responses, intrusive, images of the trauma in the form of memories, dreams, play reenactments, avoidance, recoiling from memories associated with the event, alterations in mood and cognition, particularly the sense of, did I make it happen? The younger the child, the more the danger that the child will think that something in his or her behavior is what led to the trauma because the cause-effect relationship is still very immature in young children. And an exaggerated attribution of blame to the self and to others. One um, phenomenon that we experience often is that children blame their mothers for traumatic events that happen even when the mother was not involved in the trauma because what Freud called the protective shield, the expectation that the primary caregiver will always be available and effective as a protector, that protective shield has been shattered as a result of the trauma and that needs to become a focus of the treatment. Across the age range, increased arousal and reactivity in the form of hypervigilance, distractibility, sleep disturbances, recklessness are very common to the extent that children are often diagnosed with ADHD when the diagnostician has not asked what has happened to the child. Once we know that the child has been exposed to a traumatic event, the question of to what extent these behaviors are the result of traumatic reminders continuing to have an effect on the child's experience of the self and others, and to what extent this is a biologically uh, given characteristic needs to be very carefully evaluated. And often 
children with ADHD are more likely to be exposed to traumatic uh, experiences, but also children that have experienced traumatic events show symptoms that can be mistaken as symptoms of ADHD. So it's very important to look at the symptoms that the child is manifesting from the perspective of how are these reactions to the ongoing experience of traumatic memories. Can we go on, please? Now, we are all um, make, trying to make sense of a range of uh, technical terms about that try to put a, to, to give meaning to the child's exposure to trauma. Is it developmental trauma disorder? Is it complex trauma? Is it chronic stress? Is it post-traumatic stress disorder? Is it ACEs, child traumatic stress, complex PTSD? There are many, many, many ways of talking about traumatic exposure. Each of these has something important and unique to contribute. Right now, we are looking across the different concepts to try to understand how do we identify and uh, treat traumatic exposure. Next, please. And in that sense, it's very important to look again at the experience of the child in the context of what are the developmentally expectable anxieties that all children experience, regardless of uh, whether they are exposed to traumatic events or not. These are separation anxiety, the fear of losing love and approval, the fear of body damage, and what Freud called <clears throat> the fear of superego condemnation, which is essentially the fear of not living up to the expectations of society. And once they occur in the first five years of life, they are our faithful companions throughout our lifetime. And each of these can be triggered and exacerbated by a traumatic experience so that in the context of treatment, we need to take them into account. Next slide, please. Together with the understanding of the traumatic, of the normative anxieties of childhood, we need to think also of the normative competences that involve somatic and emotional regulation and the capacity to recover from this regulation, the capacity to engage in secure attachments when we can turn to others for help with distress and fear, and repairing mismatches and tolerating ambivalence, which are part and parcel of all intimate relationships, expanding from intimate attachments to social relationships negotiating conflicts with peers and with authority figures, accepting disagreements, and managing frustration and failure and fear in the context of exploration and learning. For all of this, we need to take into account what is culturally expected of the child. What are the child-rearing values of the family and the society in which the child is operating? In this sense, trauma treatment and trauma identification always needs to be contextually determined by the interplay between normative fears and normative competencies of the child and the family. Next, please. And we always need to turn to the parent and caregiving figures because they are the ones that are going to be our allies in protection from danger, caregiving, socialization. 
at the same time, we need to remember that when a child has been traumatized, the parents are affected as well. Many times, parents and children are exposed to the same traumatic events. And the traumatic event that is affecting the child is also affecting the parent. So that the parent's capacity and self-confidence in their ability to protect, to provide appropriate caregiving, to socialize, that self-confidence might be undermined by the experience of trauma. Even when the parent has not been affected by the same trauma exposure, when one's child is traumatized, parents become vicariously traumatized. And so supporting the parent in supporting the child often involves individual sessions where we try to understand how is the parents functioning and how is the parent supporting the child and what are the obstacles in the parent's capacity to understand the child's experience and respond protectively and supportively to it. Next, please. Alicia, I also wanted to mention that we have about 15 minutes left, um, yes. so we can uh, want to make sure that we can have some time at the end for questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So in creating interventions, we look at what happened to the child, what is the experience of the child, so we might say, you saw a very frightening event when your mom and dad were fighting, you heard them screaming, you heard them pushing at each other, and now you cannot sleep, you cannot think clearly, you keep uh, responding with anger whenever something doesn't go your way, and this is a place where we can help you with those feelings. So creating interventions that create a connection between what happened and what the child is experiencing and creating hope in the treatment as a place to overcome those situations uh, is how we like to start creating interventions. And this is what we this call... It sounds like you're coming out a little bit. I'm sorry? You cut out for just a moment. If you could uh, just state your restate your what you last said. I think you cut out a little bit. Okay, creating links between the child's experience of trauma and the child's behavior and feelings and thoughts, and creating and establishing the treatment as a safe space where the traumatic experience can be processed and where safety can be created is uh, uh, an essential foundational component in the intervention. And I would like to, because there is, um, we are getting uh, close to the end of treatment, of the, of the time, I'm sorry. Um, I would like to, uh, I don't know how to do this, uh, Jan. Um, I would like to go over relatively quickly the next um, the next slides. Uh, okay. Is there a way that you can give me um, back the control and see whether I can do it? Sure, uh, Veronica. I might need your help go. with that. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Let's see. No. Uh, it seems like. Oh, oops, it went from the be to the beginning. That's okay. Can you take, take us back to the triangle? Yes. No, no. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you the presenter again. Okay. And Alicia, I will follow you. We can go okay. at whatever pace you okay. would like. So, yeah, Jan, I need you let to... me get back to that. There we go. Yeah, let's see. Go. Okay, and we can go to the next slide after the triangle. Yep. 
Uh, if you can go very quickly through, sure. uh, because that just says that assessment is considered a form of treatment. So if you could just go and the next one, mm -hmm. uh, go back, go to the next. The previous slide? Uh, Could you go back to the, could, could you go, I'm sorry, could you go forward? Of course. Okay. Once we talk to the child about the impact of trauma and how it affects, it affects feelings, then we need to follow the child's rhythm. And we find that children are often readier than the adults to talk about the traumatic event and our capacity to tolerate what the children tell us and show us in their play is one of the uh, predictors of how well the child will be able to recover from trauma. There are the following um, characteristics of treatment. Uh, could you move on, please? The overarching treatment goal is to restore affect regulation, to engage in secure relationships, and to explore and learn. Next. And we need to remember that when we do that, post-trauma growth happens. And some of the greatest spiritual, artistic, and scientific achievements resulted from coming to grips with the consequences of trauma because suffering can stimulate a search for meaning that leads to compassion for others and emotional growth. Next, please. Next. Next. Because of that, we need to establish a balance between trauma focus and the developmental momentum of the child. And creating safety in the environment is the first uh, ingredient of effective trauma treatment. So that we need to engage the caregiver and child in safety planning, meeting concrete needs, and creating a reliable daily caregiving routine that maintains safety and consistency. Next. Normalizing the traumatic response by validating it as universal and legitimate. Many children have said to us, you mean I'm not crazy. In identifying how the child responds to traumatic triggers, how a child that jumps when the bell rings because the bell ringing was the first thing that happened before a domestic violence episode occurred, can normalize the distress at the ringing of the bell once we understand the connection between that reaction and what the ringing of the bell symbolizes for the child. So that by creating the trauma narrative of my daddy rang the bell and then he came in and then he hit my mom, things start making sense and fragmentation begins to be repaired. Next, please. And that helps the child differentiate between reliving and remembering. When the child is flooded by traumatic reminders, the child goes back to the traumatic moment and does not realize that the traumatic moment is not happening again. So that helping the child reconnect to the safety of the present moment and differentiate between 
memories and current experiences is what leads to the next goals of treatment, which are, and you can go here very fast, Jan, please, which mm -hmm. are trusting in the body. We have a four-year-old who said to me, my heart is jumping so is jumping so hard that it will come out of my body. And I said to him, your heart is not going to come out of your body. You know why? Because there are all these bones that are called ribs that keep your heart in place. So let's breathe really slowly and let's do these bubbles. Let's blow bubbles. That will help your heart to come down. And in the process of engaging in behaviors that uh, connected the child with body sensations, he was able to engage in what's next happening. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, which is affect regulation through soothing, calming interactions, through giving words to what happened, and helping the parent and child, when appropriate, uh, respond to each other, which in turn leads to the next goals in the next slide, which are reciprocity in relationships by legitimizing the perspective of the different uh, partners in the traumatic experiences and by guiding the expression of negative feelings in ways that are safe and non-destructive. And the next one, please. And once the child is able to differentiate between remembering and relieving, once the child is able to trust that the sensations in the body are not going to be uh, dangerous and destructive, once the child is able to trust relationships, then engagement in learning can continue. And for this, we need to be actively providing the child with opportunities for social interactions, predictable routines, using play, and using the memory of loving moments as a way of um, uh, moving along the developmental trajectory. Um, could we go to the, to the slide that says take heart? OK. OK. Uh, Very important to take care of ourselves when we do trauma treatment, to not be discouraged, to remember that small changes matter and that mistakes can be repaired, and that we need to, regardless of what we do, define ourselves as part of a therapeutic community. Uh, some of the slides that are going to be available to you uh, talk about the importance of monitoring ourselves for vicarious trauma. Self-care is the first ingredient in caring for others. And I would like to give you the next slide, please. Gives you access to the resources of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which has a marvelous um, website called nctsn.gov that can give you uh, information and tools to um, study uh, these principles that I have been talking about in uh, greater detail. And um, um, I would like to now open ourselves to questions. Thank you very much. Alicia, thank you so much. We have some great questions lined up for you today. Okay. Um, one of the questions from our audience members is um, whether you would recommend assessing the parent's trauma in treatment. We do that routinely. Thank you for that question. It's a very important question. Uh, in fact, we often think that uh, starting out by meeting with the parents 
and asking the parents about the child's experience and the family circumstances can create a very solid uh, foundation for the treatment. Often, in understanding the parent's trauma, we are able to have a better understanding of the child's trauma. So whenever possible, I strongly recommend doing that. Okay, thank you. Another question is about uh, recommendations that you have for acknowledging and, and addressing trauma in school systems, so regarding IEPs, um, collaborative treatment teams who work between schools and the juvenile justice system. Are there any recommendations you have for that? The principles of trauma need to become uh, integrated into every system of care that involves children and their families. There is a program called HEARTS that was developed here at the San Francisco General Hospital that has uh, resulted in um, an extraordinarily um, big reduction, more than 80% reduction in suspensions. Um, uh, in uh, school among children because the identification and addressing of traumatic experiences has been incorporated into the school routine. Uh, helping pediatricians and primary providers, child welfare workers, judges, child care providers understand how trauma manifests itself, teachers in schools, is essential in helping children and that's what I meant when I said that we need to define ourselves as part of a therapeutic community by uh, um, generalizing to systems of care or understanding of how trauma affects children. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, Alicia, is um, why are children with ADHD more likely to experience traumatic events? The um, premise is that children with ADHD uh, have more difficulty um, following instructions, keeping quiet, um, uh, doing what the parents tell them to do when the parents tell them to do it, and when there is a mismatch between the parents' ability to tolerate the child's uh, restlessness and distractibility and the child's ability to respond to the parents' expectations, the likelihood of um, physical punishment that is uh, very severe and that escalates can happen. Children uh, with ADHD might also be more impulsive so they might respond to stimulation in a way that doesn't give them time to process what might be dangerous about the stimulus that they are trying to engage with. And that is the framework for the overlap between um, uh, HDHD and um, the likelihood of traumatic experience. But this is relatively speculative at this time and there isn't really systematic research documenting it. Okay, and, and um, as a follow-up to that question, Alicia, uh, any recommendations you have to differentiate ADHD from PTSD? A very thorough assessment where the assessor and the clinician ask about the child's characteristics, temperament, behavior, symptoms throughout the period of time that anteceded the trauma. What was the child's behavior like, attention, activity level, response to stimulation, what is the developmental context for the child? What happened to the child at different times in the child's development? What is the traumatic experience? What does it consist of? When did it happen? And how did the child's behavior, 
feeling and thinking change following the traumatic experience. And I think that uh, putting together the information that emerges from that investigation can help us differentiate between the two. Okay. Alicia, what, what considerations might you have for treating uh, refugee children, uh, knowing that they might be exposed to war trauma, displacement from their homes? What might be um, some particular considerations when working with that population? With refugees, with refugee children, what we are talking about is a cumulative chronic trauma. And so trying to understand the narrative of the child's history and of the family's history uh, and the cultural disruption and the cultural adaptation and the stresses that they are experiencing in adapting to a new culture need to be uh, taken into account. I think also with refugee children and families creating a cultural um, safe space where the families and the children can really speak about what happened to their culture of origin, the reasons that they left, and the uh, hopes and adversities that they are experiencing in their new culture so that there is an effort to create bridges between what was lost in the process of becoming refugees, the longing, the grief, the worry about the people who were not able to leave. There is a great deal of uh, overlap between loss and grief and trauma uh, in refugee children and families, and those need to be taken into account. Okay, thank you. This is a follow-up question to our um, our differentiation between ADHD and um, and PTSD or trauma response. Uh, isn't it also very unlikely that it would be ADHD when a trauma event has occurred, uh, especially if there's no family history of ADHD? How would you conceptually um, understand that? I often talk to my colleagues and um, about how, particularly um, uh, colleagues who medicate children, uh, about how do they make um, a decision about when to medicate a child and when uh, to use um, psychotherapy and behavioral mm -hmm. interventions. And the ones that have really um, made it their business to understand how pervasive trauma exposure is, even in uh, um, families that are uh, middle class, affluent, and whom one does not identify as necessarily uh, experiencing uh, trauma. Uh, the, the most recurrent answer that I get is that if there is trauma, then they, they privilege traumatic stress over ADHD as the most likely diagnosis. I don't know if mm. that's the question, but that is the answer that I get from um, uh, people who uh, have to make the decision about medicating mm -hmm. children for ADHD mm -hmm. versus considering the symptoms as the likely result of PTSD, that it's important to privilege trauma at least at the beginning of treatment and use a trauma-focused treatment to see whether there is relief as the result of that focus and then determine that very often what they find is that there is a very uh, um, quick reduction and significant reduction in the severity and the um, uh, frequency uh, and pervasiveness of mm -hmm. symptoms that then uh, makes whatever ADHD might have been their pre-existing the traumatic stress much more manageable. Mm 
Okay, thank you. We have a question for um, for you about uh, recommendations for uh, for people who are already trained in evidence based practices for uh, for the treatment of trauma in adult populations, where they might go to receive more in depth training for evidence based practices for treating trauma in children. So uh, maybe web based trainings through NCTSN, or if you know of workshops that are offered through UC San Francisco. There are many, many uh, opportunities. The NCTSN um, website um, offers, um, it gives uh, resources that can be reached. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague Judy Cohen uh, and Anthony Manarino uh, constantly are uh, giving uh, trainings in uh, trauma focused CPT uh, that can be. Um, um, accessed. Uh, we ourselves uh, are constantly giving um, learning collaboratives on uh, child parent psychotherapy. There are trainings in ARC, in Target with Julian Ford. Uh, it's just a matter of going to uh, the website of the NCTSN and looking at the range of alternatives for different ages and uh, um, pursuing them. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, what what framework, what theoretical framework uh, might you use in treatment for um, for trauma uh, in the adolescent population? The it's interesting. Uh, TFCBT has shown effectiveness with the adolescent population, target has shown uh, uh, effectiveness with the adolescent population. I think the goodness of fit between the therapist and the uh, treatment approach that they are using is essential. I think the conviction that the form of intervention that one is using is effective together with openness to assessing whether this is working for the child or whether it needs to be modified um, in response to the child's characteristics is, is really the, the way to go. Um, I always, always talk about the fact that um, I started out as a therapist that, was, that defined herself as psychoanalytically um, um, informed or you know as psychoanalytically oriented and attachment theory oriented and when mm -hmm. I became a member of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and I met Judy Cohen I became much more adept at using cognitive behavioral strategies as tools that are embedded as I became uh, aware of the work of Bessel van der Kolk we became much more adept at using body-based strategies so that now we are thinking of child parent psychotherapy as an integrative model that uses somatic approaches, psychodynamic approaches, attachment theory, cognitive behavioral strategies, social learning uh, strategies, I think that the question of integration of strategies to be responsive to the child's needs, it's a very exciting uh, new um, approach that the NCTSN has fostered through dialogue. And Judy Cohen tells me that she's become much more aware of the importance of attachment in the process of implementing TFCBT. So it's this dialogue where we learn from each other about different strategies that are useful. That is, I think, one of the most exciting aspects of the state of the field right now. That is very exciting. Um, thank you so much for that. We have one last question, and then we're going to um, close up for today. Uh, this question is about uh, how you might address uh, the creation of the trauma narrative when there are conflicting accounts of the trauma, perhaps from different, uh, um, you know, from perhaps from caregivers or parents um, to the child. When those narratives are different, how do you, how do you address that and is there a danger in 
in um, quote unquote forcing one narrative over another? That is, uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, that is why the foundational phase is so important. Because during the foundational phase, we take the time to meet with the relevant adults in the child's life to understand their perspective, their narrative of what happened to themselves and to the child. And we also meet with the child to find out the child's narrative of what happened. And then we have a feedback session where we talk with the parents um, and with the child, depending on the child's age, about the different narratives that exist. And we, uh, I, I can use the word negotiate, if you wish. We speak the unspeakable in terms of talking about how the parents and the child might have experienced it differently. Now, one very important caveat in this is that when a parent is considered, and there is a lot of evidence to show that the parent has been the perpetrator of the trauma, and the child perceives the parent as the perpetrator of the trauma, and the parent absolutely denies it, then we have to use our clinical skills to determine how we are going to include the parent because we don't want the delegitimization of the child's experience to um, silence the child or shame the child in his or her exploration of her own experience. So the, it makes this situation that you are describing makes for a very challenging clinical situation and it is the transparency of acknowledging different perspectives that I think is essential. And for the therapist to privilege the child's experience as a legitimate experience that needs to be validated even if the factual um, components need to be corrected because the child might have misperceived things that have happened. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I um, mean, it does sound like a very challenging situation clinically. It is. It is, and I don't want to make it appear as if it's easier than it is. But I think that mm -hmm. it, is exactly, it is exactly what makes the child's recovery difficult, that the child is knowing something that he's not supposed to know and feeling something that he's not supposed to feel. Sometimes the child's age maturity, etc., has led the child to misperceive what happened. We have a child, for example, who thought that his mother was killing his father because his mother was trying to resuscitate the father. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. understanding that misperception and correcting that misperception was the avenue towards recovery. So, that is where we need to take the time to try to understand what happened and how it is perceived by different people before we take action. Alicia, thank you so much for presenting today. This was a really informative and necessary presentation to anyone who uh, wants to have a, an in-depth understanding of trauma psychology. So thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. I do want um, I do want to, before we sign off, um, invite everyone to our October webinar, um, which will feature Frank Nooner. Um, he will be talking about narrative exposure therapy. That's going to be Friday, October 28th. We're going to be an hour earlier at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, since Frank will be uh, corresponding with us from Germany. So, Alicia, thank you so much again, and have Bye. a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye-bye.